Tansi. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we are gathered is the homeland of the Anishinaabe and Métis people. I am honored to be a guest in their homeland and to be here to share a story with you all today. I am Cree Métis. My research and teaching are centered in indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. Therefore, I intentionally introduce myself and discuss my place in this story to create a relationship with those who listen to the story. In sharing details of who I am, I acknowledge my ancestors, claim my ancestry, and declare my position first as an indigenous person and second as a researcher. I can't get the PowerPoint to change. Oh, it just went. Good. Okay, thank you. So relational accountability is central to indigenous storytelling. And it won't work again. <laughs> Someone's playing with me. Relational accountability is central to indigenous storytelling and research, as are respect, reciprocity, and relationality. Okay. There we go. Whoops, go back one. Raven Peltier Sinclair is Cree Assiniboine Saltu, and she has stated that location in indigenous research, as in life, is a critical starting point. Margaret Kovach, who is a Cree scholar, Dr. Kovach, stated that a pro prologue in native writing provides the reader with information that is essential to understanding the story. For non-indigenous people, unfamiliar with indigenous ways, this creates a space for understanding. To begin to build a relationship with everyone here today, I share a bit about myself and my ancestors. Links to ancestors, lands, and history are important to all people. However, for people who have survived an attempted genocide and forced assimilation, links to homelands are a path of reclamation, revivance, and healing. Knowing and discussing links to family, identity, and culture are basic human rights. Human rights that in contemporary times are being reclaimed by thousands of indigenous people worldwide. Tansi, my name is Paulette Steves. I am a descendant of the Cree and Métis people. I was born in the Yukon and grew up in British Columbia. My maternal grandfather, James Atkinson, and his ancestors are from the traditional Cree lands of James Bay in northern Quebec and the Métis lands of Red River in northern Ontario. Today I share a story with you that is not an easy story to tell or to hear. It is very disruptive, yet we must disrupt the comfort of forgetting and erasing histories of colonization so prevalent in Canadian society if we are to take seriously the path to healing and reconciliation. The release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's 94 calls to action in 2015 has proven to be a watershed moment in the history of relationships between Canada and Canadian Indigenous people. Many institutions at many levels began struggling with the process of reconciliation within the framework of their day-to-day -day operations and mandates. It, however, became evident to anybody who is closely watching this that this process, in many ways, is a lot harder than it may have seen, seemed at first glance. So telling a story about how discussions of healing and reconciliation in Canadian universities came to be, and leaving out the truth about historical and ongoing colonization would be an incomplete telling, erasing the significance and reducing the oppression. 
So before I go on, I just want to quickly mention, I'm citing a lot of the authors, the scholars, the indigenous scholars you see uh, in my PowerPoint here today. So on pretty much every slide, there is um, an indigenous uh, scholar. So if you're not familiar with the works of indigenous scholars that you could be including in your curriculum and pedagogy, um, you'll see a number of them today. So the stories of our ancestors make a claim on us. And in turn, we are called upon to share their stories with others. We have a responsibility both to ourselves and our ancestors to take up the project of retelling. Indigenous scholars in the academy are responsible to tell stories and create discussions that highlight unsettling truths so often ignored by many academics. In doing so, they are often seen as being overly critical or angry. Critical scholarship is truth-telling, not anger, not activism, but truth-telling that unsettles those who have been privileged with forgetting, those who do not carry the memories of forced assimilation, erasure, and genocide. A prerequisite for working towards reconciliation and indigenization of curriculum is that leadership of post-secondary institutions and faculty need to understand why this process is necessary and what successful outcomes might look like. To understand why the process is necessary, one needs to be informed of the events leading up to the discussions of healing and reconciliation. However, the facts of colonization have not historically been a part of Canadian curriculum. The majority of Canadians, even those working in post-secondary institutions, know very little to nothing about Indigenous history, culture, and current realities, except for what they have heard about in the media. Most people don't know much about the European colonization of North America and its unrelenting intergenerational impact on indigenous people. Most people have no idea about the systematic cruelty and oppression to which Canadian indigenous people were subjected. And consequently, most people don't understand how all of this stuff from the past has anything to do with present Canadian day realities. From this perspective, it's very difficult to see any real need or justification for reconciliation. Beyond the knowledge of colonization in Canada being left out of curriculum, indigenous histories, accomplishments, knowledge, have often been left out of the curriculum in all areas of education. <clears throat> when you look at curriculum on most campuses in Canada today, you will find that in all areas of education, courses about Western nations, knowledge, histories, and people are far more prevalent than course offerings centered on, <clears throat> excuse me, on indigenous histories, knowledge, and people whose very lands and literally bodies the universities are built upon. <clears throat> Though universities in Canada normalize a rhetoric of healing and reconciliation and decolonization, the fact remains that course offerings based in Western knowledge, focused on Western nations, histories, humanities, and sciences taught by non-Indigenous faculty far outnumber the few courses framed in indigenous knowledge taught by Anishinaabe and indigenous faculty. It is pivotal to discuss past and present practices in higher education and in policies, thus illuminating and creating paths to healing and reconciliation. Leadership and faculty need to discuss what they know and what they do not know and how this impedes work to decolonize and indigenize institutions and create paths to healing and reconciliation. We are what we know. We are, however, also what we do not know. If what we know about ourselves, our history, our culture, our national identity, 
is deformed by absences, denials, and incompleteness, then our identity both as individuals and Canadians is fragmented. The practice of truth-telling regarding colonial oppression in all areas of Indigenous life has been discussed as pivotal and necessary in steps towards justice. Courser noted that not to remember is to accede to the erasure or distortion of collective experience. To repress memory is to accede to the erasure or distortion of collective experience. Sorry. To repress memory is to reenact and perpetrate oppression. For indigenous people attending universities in Canada and many other countries, racism and oppression in many areas of education creates a hostile learning environment, not conducive to student success. What is normalized for settler faculty and students is often oppressive for indigenous students. The Western world view permeated through academic institutions serves to minimize, marginalize, undermine, and smother the worldviews of indigenous people in a toxic cloud of racism, sexism, and capitalism. When indigenous and Western worldviews meet under these conditions of conflict, resistance emerges on both sides. The Western worldview systematically prevails because their values are backed up by government, enforced by their laws, and perpetrated by the dominant society. However, we are entering a new era an era of indigenization and decolonization, of healing and reconciliation. Or rather, the federal government has suggested that academics indigenize and decolonize with discussions of Vision 2020 and education about all for all. Though a few universities have made great strides towards creating safe indigenous spaces, hiring indigenous faculty, the darkness and non-reflection of indigenous history life and presence in curriculum persists in many areas of higher education. Many academics avoid teaching and learning regarding genocide in Canada in discussions of the long wars of forced acculturation on many generations of Indigenous people, leading to present and future intergenerational trauma. Faculty and administrators are responsible to be informed of and to discuss indigenous scholarship on healing and reconciliation, no matter how threatening or critical they may find it to be. We all have an opportunity to grow from open and safe discussions of indigenous experiences and discussions of past to reconciliation. So I wanna ask for a show of hands. How many people in the audience here are in a leadership position or faculty at a university or college? Oh, good, there's a whole bunch. Okay, great. Yay. So how many people uh, know about the work of Michelle Daigle? One, two, three, four. How many people have read her paper, The Spectacle of Reconciliation on the Unsettling Responsibilities to Indigenous People in the Academy? One, two? Okay, so that's a hint to the rest of you that are here in leadership and faculty, right? Thank you. So Michelle Daigle Cree cited numerous indigenous academic scholars in arguing that this is an era marked by the spectacle of reconciliation, a public, large-scale, and visually striking performance of indigenous suffering and trauma alongside white settler mourning and recognition which secures, legitimates, and effectively reproduces white supremacy and settled fortuity in Canada. The spectacle of reconciliation in Canada has been painted, choreographed, and neatly wrapped in visuals of residential school trauma and suffering in the past, thereby masking the colonial present and erasing public conscience of contemporary oppression and colonization. Residential schools were one of many forms of oppression and assimilation for almost 500 years, 
not 160, 500 years in Canada. The first school was opened by the Recollet nuns in Quebec in 1520. That's not three or four, even five generations of indigenous people experiencing trauma. That's more like 20. Many stories of forced assimilation and oppression in Canada are just beginning to emerge from long silenced and repressed memories. Publicly sharing of experience of oppression will undoubtedly come to light in the justice of telling and acknowledging for decades. No one knows or has even asked, what is the half-life of intergenerational trauma on such a large scale? This is my cousin, um, Jeffrey Schofield. He uh, gave me this beautiful pipestone and turquoise necklace. He's a well-published poet and writer and a tenured faculty member at the University of Victoria. He recently posted this brief discussion about educational responsibilities on Facebook. It is the responsibility of every Canadian, new or old, to educate themselves on the genocide allowed to happen in this country, in a country so many are proud to call home. It is the responsibility of every Canadian to learn the history of residential schools and to carry this knowledge this system of genocide into the next generation to be remembered, to be retold, and to be honored. This country, which so many are proud to call home, is built on genocide. And it really is our responsibility for every Canadian to teach his history to their children and to ensure they know the country upon which they walk was not created from a glorious colonial history but rather a history of systematic removal, convenient amnesia, and an ongoing denial. There are bones of indigenous children scattered across this country, unmarked, forgotten. They were not given the privilege to walk into a new generation armed with knowledge and hope. They were not given the privilege of coming home to themselves armed with sacred knowledge and words to give their own children. Some universities have taken great steps to acknowledge and address the impacts of colonization in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. Some schools have implemented policies and educational initiatives focused on indigenizing their campuses and curriculum. Many schools, however, have not committed the required funding that would support the desired outcomes of indigenizing and decolonizing campuses and curriculum. Instead, they rely on a few indigenous staff and faculty to shoulder the burden and responsibility for doing all of the work to create safe, decolonized spaces and educate non-indigenous students and peers. Often having to face and teach settler faculty, some who become wonderful peers and allies, and others who refuse to listen or take seriously the need for change. However, in work to move along paths of healing and reconciliation, many institutions and people often miss a very crucial first step, in that to decolonize institutions and curriculum, administration, faculty, and staff must first be fully informed regarding what colonization entailed for indigenous people in Canada, and what colonization and oppression look like in literature and media, curriculum, policies, laws, and practices so normalized and embedded in all areas of Canadian society. Unless you have lived with the ongoing impacts of colonization as an Indigenous person in Canada, you are most likely not aware of the impacts of governmental and educational policies that erased and dehumanized Indigenous peoples across the last 150 years. Indigenous people carry the weight and impacts of intergenerational trauma of colonization every day in their memories and in ongoing struggles for justice, in their work to combat racism, in policy, law, government, healthcare, education, and every aspect of daily life. University campuses and classrooms often remain 
colonized Western spaces where fights for justice and unerasure and the, are just uh, a fight against the rise of a cacophony of Western rhetoric framed in Eurocentric views. So many Indigenous scholars have argued that the Academy remains a bastion of colonization clinging tightly to a legacy of power and control vested completely in Western thought. Despite embedded Western rhetoric and policies in higher education, some Indigenous students actually report they enjoy their courses and they love their faculty. After all, as Daniel Heath Justice stated, if the Academy was nothing more than an ideological death camp, Indigenous people would not aspire to higher education. University administrators are tasked with the work of decolonizing their institutions, yet they are bound by <coughs> embedded Western policies and practices. So scholars have claimed that universities remain a culture that is still and for the most part invested in indigenous erasure and marginalization. Godry and Lorenz argue that in general, the Canadian Academy has rhetorically adopted an aspirational vision of reconciliation and indigenization, but is in fact committed to indigenous inclusion. In essence, post-secondary institutions are attempting to merely increase the number of indigenous people on campus without broader changes. So that's a hint that we need to address policy, pedagogy, and much more. Godry and Lorenz further state that indigenous inclusion policy is a vision that ultimately expects indigenous people to bear the burden of change. Indigenous students, faculty, and staff are expected to adapt to an intellectual worldview, teaching and research of a Western academy. However, over the last few decades, some indigenous scholars have knocked down a few walls and forged inroads into academic institutions and in teaching. Learning through indigenous pedagogies, indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, teaching on the land, and community-centered research. Teaching and learning that weaves indigenous knowledges and practices through Western education, enriching and expanding curriculum and pedagogy thus enhancing all student experiences, a praxis that Albert Marshall called two-eyed seeing, a weaving of indigenous and Western knowledge. So in academic research, some indigenous scholars braid their studies through research as ceremony, framed in respect, relationality, and reciprocity. Others work to decolonize literature and curriculum through a praxis of critical indigenous scholarship and what I termed pyroepistemology. Pyroepistemology is a meta metaphorical terminology that acknowledges colonization in all areas of life, including policy and education, and highlights indigenous ways of creating healthy change leading to healing and reconciliation. I think of this as a ceremony of rebirth, which is found in indigenous practices of pyro-regeneration. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples have practiced many forms of environmental management. A traditional practice in many areas, pyro-regeneration, burns away the dense forest undergrowth and allows sunlight to bring new life to the earth. Pyroepistemology is a term that I coined which metaphorically describes critical indigenous scholarship. A practice of pyroepistemology is a ceremony which cleanses the social landscape of discussions that dehumanize and misinform worldviews and fuel racism. Such literary renewal clears the way for a healthy growth in academic fields of thought and centers of knowledge production. While some scholars may be offended at one, what some may see as an act of transgression, of cleaning the curriculum and literature of great writers' publications that just happen to dehumanize indigenous people, I would argue that this work is pivotal to addressing racism and discrimination. Sandy Grand argued 
Transgression is the root of emancipatory knowledge, and emancipatory knowledge is the basis of a revolutionary pedagogy. Is decolonizing of curriculum in the Western Academy revolutionary? Some may think so. However, there is a very long history of revolutionary pedagogy and emancipatory knowledge creating a better and more just world. Discussing Canadian and American Academy's colonial past and ongoing impacts on Indigenous people will guide us along one path of many, which leads to the Eighth Fire, where cleansing smoke offers opportunities of healing through rituals of respect and reciprocity. Leanne Simpson discussed an Anishinaabe prophecy, predictions which have foretold history since creation. The later part of that prophecy relays that we are currently living in a time of the seventh fire, a time when after a long period of colonization and cultural loss, the new people emerge. It is the new people's responsibility involve, involve reviving our language, philosophies, political and economic traditions, our ways of knowing and our culture. The foremost responsibility of the new people is to pick up things previous generations have left behind by nurturing relationships with elders who have not fallen asleep. The new people are responsible for decolonizing, for rebuilding our nation, and for forging new relationships with other nations by returning to their original Nishnabe visions of peace and justice. According to the prophecy, the work of the new people determines the outcome of the eighth fire, an eternal fire to be lit by all humans. It is an everlasting fire of peace, but its existence depends on our actions and choices today. In order for the eighth fire to be lit, settler society must also choose to change their ways, to decolonize their relationships with the land and with indigenous nations, and to join us in building a sustainable future based upon mutual recognition, justice, and respect. In my experience in teaching in universities over the last six years, I have learned that a great deal of Canadian history is not known to the general non-indigenous population. Both students and faculty have informed me that they were not aware of Canada's long history of colonization against indigenous people. Educational institutions and faculty are responsible for their selectives or non-inclusion of Canadian history of colonization in curriculum. People choose what to discuss and not to discuss, and there needs to be a formulation of university policy on pedagogy for healing and reconciliation that this needs to be discussed in all areas of education. Indigenous people and their like-minded peers have poured their hearts, souls into struggles of liberation, human rights, acknowledgement of broken treaties, reclaiming, reviving, and recentering indigenous knowledge into all areas of life. In work to rehumanize, revive, reclaim all areas of indigenous culture and life, indigenous scholars and their like-minded peer work to center indigenous histories, language, knowledges, and curriculum in Canada. Some territories and provinces have created decolonized curriculum in primary and secondary grades. A few indigenous-centered colleges and universities have been successful in creating indigenized, decolonized curriculums. Yet many universities and colleges in Canada still struggle with the work of decolonization. And institutions, others have yet to begin. Some don't even know how many of their classes or courses include indigenous knowledge, and right? This is an important thing to know because how do you include knowledge if you don't know it's missing? So to decolonize curriculum, faculty in every academic field need to be informed of indigenous scholars publications and indigenous communities knowledge, teaching and learning. Faculty all have PhDs. They know how to do their homework. They know how to do research. If they wanted, they would know how to find indigenous curriculum and literature and published works within their area of study. Believe me, it exists within e every area. Faculty know how to research conferences and learning experiences of indigenous knowledge. 
indigenous sciences, and humanities. Though there are areas of teaching and learning and ceremony that can only be led by indigenous people, elders, and communities, settler faculty do not need an indigenous person or community to lead them through the process of finding indigenous literatures, reading it, and learning, and discussing the facts of colonization or to becoming informed of indigenous histories and ways of being, knowing, and doing. There has been an amazing explosion of published works by indigenous authors in all areas of the academy. And there are hundreds of websites on indigenous organizations, communities, knowledge, teaching, and learning. Some settler faculty have taken the initiative to become informed to learn about the history and impacts of colonization and to actually go out and meet with indigenous communities and to create community-centered research and become partners and allies in struggles to decolonize the academy. Marie Batiste, a Cree scholar, stated, 2% of faculty in Canadian universities are indigenous. There are not enough of us to do all of the work of decolonization, healing, and reconciliation in all universities and colleges in Canada. We need faculty peers and allies to become informed, to step up, and to become a part of decolonizing academies and creating safe learning spaces for all people. Faculty also need support from their administrators in navigating processes of indigenization and decolonization. Faculty really need two things to become informed peers and allies to carry out the work of decolonization. One, they need a willingness to learn about colonization and genocide in Canada. And two, they need the support, fiscal and other, of university administrators. This means that people in places of institutional leadership need to learn about the realities of colonization and the importance of supporting faculty and taking on the needed fiscal responsibility and work to decolonize the academy and curriculum and make safe learning spaces. So there are many ways that universities and colleges can support faculty and work to decolonize curriculum in the academy. They can provide indigenous literature and research publications. They can provide funding and paid leave for faculty to attend indigenous conferences and learning experiences. There are many ways to support faculty, but making this university policy is pivotal to creating positive change that reflects movements towards healing and reconciliation. Creating policy to initiate targeted hires of indigenous faculty in all areas of the academy, building teaching and research relationships with indigenous communities, that is a crucial first step in educational processes focused on decolonizing higher education. So some universities um, have created positions for indigenous advisors to the president and have created departments focused on indigenous initiatives and knowledge. Created partnerships in teaching and learning with communities, hired indigenous staff in a number of areas to support the work of decolonizing, healing and reconciliation, and hired indigenous faculty. Yet, in many academies, an important piece of healing and reconciliation is still missing, and I've heard numerous people over the last two days discuss this. But in part because accepting colonization and genocide is painful work for many people, not just indigenous people, but for settler people as well. There is a component of guilt and denial but to build paths to healing and reconciliation, we must first acknowledge and openly discuss the history of colonization, genocide, and oppression of indigenous people in Canada. And we must discuss ways to combat ongoing racism and colonization, not just within the general public, not just within the student body, within the faculty body as well. There can be no reconciliation or healing without truth. And the truth is that indigenous people are still dealing with the impacts of colonization, intergenerational trauma, ongoing social and political disparities, while at the same time working to recover and revive their languages, songs, dances, cultures, reclaim their lands, and protect the environment. <clears throat> 
and all of their relation amid a rising tide of environmental destruction threatening to envelop the earth. So healing and reconciliation begin with truth-telling and teaching delivered from an indigenous perspective, truth about Canada's genocidal policies, racism, and dehumanization of indigenous people. Until educators learn about the brutality of colonization in Canada, they cannot begin to create discourses or curriculums that are decolonized to create the positive changes need to move along paths to healing and reconciliation. While the government and institutional mandates focused on healing and reconciliation and education in Canada generally, it does bring hope and promise, but they still have missed the most important first step of truth-telling, specifically in education. Um, leadership and faculty in Canadian universities must get past the comfort zone of privilege to not know, to not remember, and not understand colonization. They must become fully informed of Indigenous peoples' pasts and ongoing experiences under colonization and the resulting and ongoing intergenerational trauma among Indigenous people and students in Canada today. If they are serious about working to decolonize curriculum and pedagogy and creating paths to healing and reconciliation. Healing and reconciliation is everybody's work and everybody will benefit from decolonized institutions. This is not only about teaching and learning and higher education, it's a ceremony where students and educators and leaders learn how indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, and practices of respect, relationality, and reciprocity lead to paths that bridge the divides, leading to the eighth fire, a place of eternal peace for all people. When people become informed allies and peers with indigenous communities and people in work to decolonize institutions, curriculum, and life, they become the drops of knowledge that send ripples of hope across thousands of miles, making the world a much better place for all people. <laughs>